be here. Thank you. As a kid, I grew up in Maryland. We vacationed on both sides of the river state, in Asheville and in the Alabanks. I love North Carolina. It goes deep and old for me. I'm going to talk to you about something that has swept me off my feet. Actually, it's been quite a spiritual journey for me. It's about making medicines and making medicines for everyone, not just for those who can afford them. It's been a beautiful journey. Okay? And it begins with there being lots of people in the world working in health, lots of people in the world who are committed to health. Humans can't stand by when a loved one, or now even a stranger, needs help, needs an intervention. Okay? And we know that there's a way to do it, and a company is not doing it, or a government is not doing it. We don't stand by. We act. I'd like to carry you through a presentation, and by the end, see that even with the pharmaceutical industry, something as big and powerful as the pharmaceutical industry, we have opportunities to intervene and to change things and to make them better for everyone. Medicines are precious. There are lots of ways to heal, and beginning with medicines is not the way to go. But in the end, when everything else has failed and you need a medicine, it should be there, regardless of where you live and how much you have to pay. We aren't there yet in the world. Aspirin is very, very cheap. Okay? Yet how many African providers have come up to me at global health meetings and said, this isn't about developing new technologies, Victoria. This is about getting the inexpensive technologies that we have out there. How much suffering in the world goes on just because we don't deliver the medicines we already have. It's a spiritual journey that began as a spiritual crisis for me. Working in the pharmaceutical industry where there is a belief, a duality that is false, a belief that when you have a profitable product, a profitable medicine, if you should make it available to the poor, if you should make it available to everyone, then that means that you lose money. Okay? I don't believe that that is true. We need to demonstrate that that's not true, but it's a belief that guides industry right now, for-profit industry. The first nonprofit pharmaceutical company that I found was dedicated to infectious diseases. It was a classic nonprofit model. It's what many people are doing in the world today with rare diseases and orphan diseases. It has many strengths, but it requires incredible family commitments from individuals like Bill and Melinda Gates or Warren Buffett. So how many such organizations can be supported in the world? One of the lessons is we need to create businesses for these diseases. We need to go beyond expecting the Gates family or the Buffett family to fund all of the work that we do, to move beyond nonprofits. Another sobering lesson is that it's not about the technology. Just as with the pain story, we have very inexpensive analgesics that we could provide to the world and we don't. Is it really always about developing new medicines? Or is it really something that's very low tech? Is it really about us getting the medicines that we already have out to more people in the world? And I argue that that's the case, that we're in that place right now. And that you don't have to be a technologist. You don't have to be a scientist. In fact, we have plenty of those working in health and in medicines. What we need is individuals who think differently to move these products out to really have an impact. It's not enough to develop a medicine if you don't have an impact. Another lesson from working with nonprofit pharmaceuticals is that you need a business model that will carry you forward. You need a business model where you actually have revenue and profits. And is this possible? Of course it's possible. You can't work in leishmaniasis and have this be very possible, but you can work in contraception. That's what we're doing right now. We're developing a contraceptive to be sold in the United States, commercial markets, to bring back revenues and profits that will then fund the US public sector and developing countries. Okay? Dual markets for very important products, the most effective contraceptives that exist that very few women have access to. So it's wonderful to have beautiful scientific innovation, such as here at the university. But if we don't pair that with innovation in our business models, then we're limited in terms of where our scientific innovation can go. We're severely limited. It's business models that need to innovate right now. 
We live in a world where there is a realization and an appreciation of the magnitude of disparity, the impact of disparity. And people don't stand still. People march, people protest, people speak. And the same has happened in medicine and in the development of medicines. And I'll get back to that in a minute. But is it really too much to ask for, for a better world for everyone? Can we really afford it? Not with our current business models, we can't. They're not built to do that. J.P. Gagne is a former CEO of GlaxoSmithKline. And at a global health conference, uh, maybe five years ago, I had the opportunity to interview him about his work in developing countries. And one of the questions that was quite poignant, his face changed when he answered the question. I asked, how do you get your medicines and vaccines out into the developing world, in particular, way, way out, rural villages? And his face changed and became very serious. And he said, we don't know how to do that. We haven't figured out how to do that. And Big Pharma does not know how to do that. And to expect them and look to them to know how to do it is the wrong thing to do. Right? They know what they know how to do, and they do it very well. We need to look to others. We need to look to us to figure out how to do these things. So not looking to the pharmaceutical industry for every issue related to medicines, right? but to look elsewhere. The world is a bit chaotic, quite a bit of turbulence. It can be quite frightening and confusing, overwhelming sometimes. If we step back from it a bit, it's actually quite awesome. If we get out of the day-to-day -day details, it's quite powerful. It can be swept away with the magnificence of the organization of it all, right? With the force. It goes another level, though. It goes deeper. It goes to a spiritual place. It goes to a place where there's universal energy and a force and a beauty that's a part of each of us, regardless of where we work or where we're from or how much money we make. Right? This beauty right, is not something that we often recognize in our world. It's, not, it's something that we forget we have in our world. There are thousands and thousands of people working to address market failures in the pharmaceutical industry. Right? In particular, Classic market failures are rare and orphan diseases, genetic disorders, and then neglected tropical diseases, diseases of global poverty. Okay. There are 2,000 organizations dedicated to rare and orphan diseases. And more than 100 of them are developing medicines or treatments or diagnostics. <laughs> there are dozens of neglected tropical disease organizations funded by Europe or the United States government or the Gates and Buffett foundations. There are lots and lots of people who said, we're not going to stand by while our family members die or become ill. We're going to do something. We're just ordinary people, but at least we're going to come together. At least we're going to advocate. At least we're going to go to Congress and make something happen. At least we're going to fund researchers at universities to understand what these diseases are. And for tropical diseases, we know what the diseases are and we know what the pathogens are. Now we're going to make medicines. I had a bit of an existential moment um, a few years ago, working in infectious diseases in global health. The truth is that these diseases are caused by parasites or viruses or bacteria. This is leishmaniasis, malaria, schistosomiasis, cholera. But in reality, we're going after the wrong thing with our anti-infective approaches, right? We're trying to kill the pathogens. We have a war on pathogens, right? Wrong. Pathogens don't cause these diseases. Poverty causes these diseases, all of these diseases, and we know that, right? Do we stop working then on the pathogens? Do we stop working in global health? I almost did. I had to call um, a good 20 social entrepreneurs that I know who are not working in global health to ask, what are, we, what are we doing here? If we aren't all working together, if we aren't all networked, if we aren't all coming together as a community, how are we really gonna impact any of this? We'll just keep making more medicines and more medicines. It's really about poverty. Okay? The simplicity of that, the beauty of that, the awesomeness of that, right, can be overwhelming or it can be freeing. A 
the revolution in the pharmaceutical industry. Has it ever happened before? Or is this just your dream? Right? It's happened twice in my lifetime, in my professional lifetime. The generics industry revolutionized the pharmaceutical industry so that lower cost medicines could be made available in the United States and around the world. The biotechnology industry, for different reasons, because the science is very different, has revolutionized the pharmaceutical industry in the past. So if we come together and decide that there is another reason to revolutionize the current pharmaceutical industry, there's precedent for it. The industry will survive and thrive. What do we want to do? What are our priorities? How would we do this? Do we really need pharmaceutical companies? Do the rare and orphan disease organizations and entities, many of whom probably there are laboratories here at your university where you're doing research, or for the tropical diseases, do you really need a pharmaceutical company to pick up your medicine and carry it forward? Maybe, maybe. It depends on who you want to reach, but maybe not. I'll tell you one thing that's for sure. There are too many orphan and rare diseases and not enough pharmaceutical companies anymore. Pharmaceutical companies are disappearing, right? They're merging. They're shrinking. They're laying off professionals that never had to worry about a job before. Okay. This is because blockbusters aren't as abundant as they used to be. They've all moved to generics, right? That's OK. That's life, right? That's the uh, up and down. Those are the cycles. And the pharmaceutical industry will survive, right? But what about these rare and neglected and orphan diseases? What do we do with them? I propose we don't stand and wait for industry. I propose that we build new models, that we build hybrid models, that we move beyond the nonprofit organizations that we have right now and take these forward into the world. There is profit to be made. There is plenty of profit to be made. Or there is enough profit to be made. So the 99% and the brewing and the building and the energy and the momentum that is there is a beautiful thing. Let's harness it. We have incredible resources that are so committed to health and that are so committed to making it happen. Many of us are working as individuals, though, in parallel. We don't know how many of us there are. If we came together, what could we do? Sorry. Sorry. What if we came together as the pharmaceutical industry does and we lobbied? What if we went to Congress? What if we had legislation passed for our new sector? a sector that benefits everyone? What if we had regulations that benefited this sector because we are committed to public health? Okay. What if we had preferences that were set up? What if we had fill in the blank? What do you want to have happen? What if we had a group of health organizations right, that we could brand, that people came to say, OK, take a deep breath. You're going to laugh at this. What if people began to say, my pharmaceutical company? What if people began to put those words together, my pharmaceutical company? What if they even added, I love my pharmaceutical company? <laughs> Can you imagine? What would that take? Right? Um, not a whole lot, considering where we are right now. Right? If we simply produce product for people that everyone can afford, I, I argue that society is ready. I'll speak for Americans. I know Europeans and the rest of the world a bit less. I believe it's possible. Okay. And it's up to us. It's not going to come from within the industry. It's going to come from those of us who are healers, one and all. Some of the work that we do in healing is alternative medicine. Some of the work that we do is real medicine. Some of it is preventive. Some of it is just remembering to breathe. Right. Healing is complex, but it's simple. Heavy fingers, sorry. OK, I'm going to tell you a story of my eldest, who's now a sophomore in college. In kindergarten class, he had a male kindergarten teacher, a very wonderful teacher, who sat the kindergarteners in the middle of the room and had the parents all around the walls. Right? And had where Holden was sitting is where the teacher was standing. And the teacher asked on this first day of kindergarten, how many of you know how to dance? And what do the students do? Me, 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 all of them, right? How many of you know how to sing? 
And what did they do? What did the kindergartners do? Some of the girls didn't even raise their hands. They just burst out in song, <laughs> right? Of course they're singers. Of course was their answer. You silly. How many of you know how to paint? All of them knew how to paint. Then the teacher, John was his name, asked the parents around the room, how many of you know how to dance? Um, I think everyone looked at their shoes, maybe one woman quietly lifted one hand. How many of you know how to sing? And there maybe one or two people, and the rest look at their shoes. And how many of you know how to paint? How many of you are artists? Very few. And then John asked, what happened to you? <laughs> what happened to you between kindergarten and adulthood? You, you used to know, silly. You used to know that you were a dancer, and you are a singer, and you're a painter, and a sculptor. You're everything. You're whatever you, you choose to be. And in our world, if there was one thing that I could wish for all of us, okay, is that we would let go of our beliefs that hold us back. Let go of these beliefs that have accumulated in our brains and in our hearts. Right? These beliefs, these experiences, and dare I say, these fears, these fears, that lead us to believe that these challenges in our world are too big for us. That these problems in our world are not something that I'm aligned with. I'm not a dancer. I can't fix that problem. But that we each remember what our gifts are and bring those dreams, bring those dreams back to life right? and do it. Right? The world is poised. The world is ready. Right? There is extreme what appears to be chaos, but it's not really chaos, is it? It's a powerful force that's unified, right? And there is an incredible beauty that's calling to us, right? In a very elegant way. This is very doable. Many problems in the world. And it comes down to being a kindergartner, thinking like a child, and believing that anything is possible. <laughs>